This is a full compilation of videos in the series. What Unsolved Mystery Gives You the Creeps? Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow if you enjoy the video. Part 1. Account 1. A guy I knew was found dead in his apartment. The police said he was attacked and had been murdered. A few weeks later, they say it was an error and it was suicide. He was dating this girl, who was the daughter of the sheriff the next county over. They argued a lot, and she would tell him things like, if you died, no one would know who killed you, and other creepy stuff to scare him. She was a psychopath, and apparently would hit her previous ex-boyfriends, and possibly even him, he never would tell us though. He was not suicidal, and he died just a few days after breaking up with her after a big argument. I spoke to the police about him and his girlfriend's behavior, and they told me nothing could be done since the case was closed. Account 2. In France, we have the Gregory Affair. A mother goes get her four years old boy at the child minder, once at home lets him play in the front yard while she does some laundry. Fifteen minutes later, the boy is missing. Someone calls the boy's uncle and tells him, I have taken the boy, and says he lies dead in the river. The boy is found dead hands and feet tied at the bottom of the river nearby. The whole investigation is a total clusterfuck, during which various members of the family are accused at some point, culminating with the boy's father killing one accused member of the family with a shotgun. The case was reopened last year because of additional information, then the man who was the judge at the time committed suicide. We still don't know who did it. Account 3 the disappearance of the Island Moor lighthouse keepers. The scene found by the people that went to check why there was no response was quite standard, yet slightly off. Two of the three waterproof jackets were missing, and in the kitchen they found pretty much everything normal, except that one chair laying on the floor, and there was still a meal on a table, suggesting that maybe they left in a hurry. The light keepers were nowhere. The only clues that were gathered came from the lighthouse's log. The entries the last few days there were written were weird. Severe winds the likes of which I have never seen before in 20 years. The log attendant, Thomas Marshall, wrote also noticed that James Duckett, the principal keeper, had been very quiet and that the third assistant, William MacArthur, had been crying. What is strange about the last thing is that William MacArthur was a seasoned mariner and was known on the Scottish mainland as a tough guy. Storm shouldn't have been a big deal. Entries the day later stated that the storm was still raging even worse than before, and that the lighthouse keepers had been praying for it to stop. BTW, the lighthouse that was 150 feet above sea level, and not only they should have been perfectly safe, but they should have known that. They were very experienced. The thing is that no storms were reported in the whole area in any of the days close to the entries. The weather was calm. The final log entry was made the day after. It said storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. Account 4. Disappearance of Asha Degree. Nine-year-old girl packs a backpack and leaves her home between midnight and 5 a.m. during a storm. Several motorists see her along a highway. There is evidence of her in a nearby barn. Her backpack is found over a year later wrapped in plastic buried at a construction site. She's never been found. What bothers me about this one is I suspect she was quietly communicating with an adult who was pretending to be her friend. I get that haunting if only I was just there feeling with this mystery more than most. Account 5. There was this mystery show where they did two fake stories and one real one. They would reveal the true story at the end of the show. One episode had a story where a child was afraid of his closet and wouldn't go near it and complain about hearing noises from it to his parents. One day, his older brother and a friend locked the boy in the closet. The kid was kicking and screaming trying to get out, but then he went silent. The brother opened the door and the boy was gone. There was nowhere for him to escape the closet, though. They revealed that this was the true story for the episode. Edit, the show was beyond belief, fact or fiction. Account 6. In the 1980s, over a period of 17 months, Japan was held in the grip of terror by just such a powerful criminal force. The case would turn the country on its head, push police to their limits, dispel the notion that Japan was a completely safe place, and 30 years later remains just as unsolved and mysterious as it has ever been. This is the story of the notorious monster with 21 faces, an organization led by an enigmatic figure 
which proved to be just as untouchable and elusive as any supervillain, which led the police on an unprecedented manhunt and whirlwind investigation for a crime they would never get to the bottom of, and which has gone on to become one of the most puzzling unsolved crimes in Japanese history. Unable to capture the suspect believed to be the mastermind behind the monster with 21 faces, the police superintendent Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture committed suicide by self-immolation in August 1985. Account 7. There may be a serial killer currently targeting young men in their early 20s in the Boston area. They go missing after a night drinking and end up in the Charles with a puncture wound from a needle. The police haven't released any other details, and this has been going on for years. Edit. As to the needle mark, I'm currently going to school in the Boston area for criminal justice, and a lot of my professors are Boston police, prosecutors, and they often hint at foul play, and one time in class, a Boston police officer slipped the mention of a needle mark in most cases. I know that's not the most reliable source of info, but that's all I got. He also mentioned the police are keeping most of the details from these cases from the public so they don't start a panic and that it won't interfere with their investigation. Account 8. This young lady has been missing over 20 years. Every day on my way to work, I see the flyers her family still puts up, begging for information. She was last seen less than 15 minutes from where I live. Once found the rib bone from a large goat while we were digging out a portion of the basement. The house had been added onto. This section of basement had once been part of the old barn. Still get the heebie-jeebies whenever I have to dig anywhere on the farm. Account 9. Solved, but really creepy. I just watched a show about this woman that was kept in a coffin-sized box for 23 hours a day for seven years. It was called Kidnapping of Colleen Stan. She was brought out for an hour a day to be raped by a couple. The coffin was kept under a bed. She said it was like a hundred degrees in the box. It was hard to breathe in the box. These people put her in the box, put it under a bed, shoved a bunch of crap around it, and then slept on the bed. 23 hours a day? In a wooden box? Under a bed? The guy actually took her home to visit her parents after a few years. They told the parents that they were engaged. Parents even took a photo of them. Then she went back to the box. The wife eventually helped her escape after raping her for seven years. The wife was jealous of her, thought the husband was in love with her. Apparently, she went on to get an accounting degree, married, and have a daughter, while also setting up an organization to help abused women with the guy's wife who ultimately turned the husband in. How the fuck did this lady end up normal? Account 12. I know this is a really shitty description, but in the early 1900s, pretty sure, an entire family was murdered in their farm. Weeks before this, the maid complained about mysterious happenings around the house, and footprints were found in the snow leading into the woods. Also, two days after the date, investigators said they were murdered. Neighbors said there was smoke coming from the chimney edit. The Hinter Kaifek murders. Account 13. For many decades, there was only one hospital in the area I grew up their closest competition about a half-hour drive away. For about 20 years, they've had a reputation for screw-ups and questionable patient deaths. Both as a patient and being there for family members, I've had multiple experiences that made me agree with that reputation. Several years ago, there was a big to-do, as someone was murdered there. Their killer got past security after visiting hours, bypassed all medical staff, and then suffocated their victim with a pillow. The body was found with the pillow still over the victim's face, a fact the police reported in an interview on the case. Time passes, and new reports come up that the victim was strangled with cords in their hospital room, then the pillow was placed over the face. A few days after that, there's a new report. There was no murder, it was an accident where the bedridden victim somehow found the strength to get up, gather the cords in the room, then pull them tight enough to choke themselves to death. And now there was no mention of the pillow the police noted as being there. The media dropped the story immediately after that last report, with no questioning about the changes in the report. On top of that, if you try and search online, the local TV stations seem to have totally scrubbed their old reports, except for one which has the accident version of the story and nothing else. 
About 20 years before this, I got to witness a similar change in the facts regarding the reports of a fellow who died, because it looked bad for his employer that his death was because he did something stupid while looting. I honestly think the hospital used its clout to force the local media to bury their original reports and go with the accident theory so as not to get a worse reputation. I really feel like someone got away with murder in part due to them wanting to protect the brand image. Account 14. Tamam Shud, or Summerton Man. Just really bizarre and creepy, it's got an X-Files vibe to it. TLDR. Well-dressed, athletic guy is found dead leaning against a seawall on an Australian beach. No cause of death is discovered, despite autopsy. No ID, no labels on any of his clothes, nothing to identify him, but a scrap of printed paper saying Taman Shud found in his pocket. No one is reported missing. Later, a briefcase is found in a locker at a train station attributed to him, with a few clothes marked T. Keen. No one named that is found missing. When the info about the note is released, one of the locals finds an odd book in the back seat of his car in the area that the man died in. The piece of paper matches the torn out bit in the book. In the book, there is a very odd cipher that no one has been able to decode since, and a phone number. Blood pooling in the body suggest he didn't die with his head propped against the wall as he was found. Half-smoked cigarette found fallen out of his mouth, but if he died in a different position, would be a little odd. Body was embalmed and put on display for six months and received a lot of attention, but no one can remember having seen him. No family or anyone knowing him have ever been found. Tamam Shud roughly means the end times. Tamam Shud or Summerton Man. Just really bizarre and creepy, it's got an X-Files vibe to it. Account 15. When hundreds of people reportedly saw and many recorded all those UFOs in the sky over the American Southwest. Edit, Phoenix AZ 1997. I legitimately saw them with my own eyes. I lived in Phoenix at the time and was out driving around with some friends, totally not smoking pot. But those lights were unmistakable, a triangle of lights. I told my mom the next day and she thought I was mental until the story broke. Stoner me was vindicated. The thing that gets me is that the governor of Arizona at the time gave a real press conference addressing the sighting, and in the middle of it, dudes in alien costumes stormed the stage and basically turned it into a joke. And the government laughed it off with no explanation. Part 2. Account 1. Story I've told for years. A friend of a friend went backpacking by himself in the Rockies with a camera. After the trip, when he developed the pictures, there was a picture of himself sleeping. I've seen the picture, and I'm pretty sure his story has been published in magazine articles. Gives me the creeps every time I think about it. Account 2. Andrew Gosden. The boy simply left his house, withdraw $200 from a bank account, took a one-way ticket to London, and simply vanished. It is especially weird since he never skipped school. He had 100% attendance there. Also, it seemed he went to London to watch a concert from a band he was a big fan. Also, he didn't took an electronic charger for his PSP, which suggests that he probably didn't expect to be gone for too long. My personal theory is that he met some creepy guy online or in person who probably used his love for the band to lure him to London, probably said something like, don't worry about a return ticket, I will take you back home. Account 3. The Devil's Footprints. All over England, one snowy morning, hundreds of miles of hoof prints appeared in the snow. What was unusual was not only how far and wide the reports were, but where the prints went. Across open fields and over rooftops, taking a straight path through everything where it would be impossible for an animal to make them, still hasn't been completely explained. Account 4. Back in 1998, I lived in a farm. I was tenyo. My parents and I were building our house in the, the city. So on weekends, we would go and paint and fix the place. On the way back, we had to go to the farm, and we passed through an R that is open. No tree, nothing else but a windmill pulling water. Out of the blue, a massive white light blinds everyone in my family. We were in a Ford F-100 single cabin truck, the four of us facing the windshield. The burst of light was followed by a high-pitched noise. My father had to stop and pull over. It was the middle of the night in a rural open area, nothing around us. We heard some noises above the truck, and my father said, fuck no, and hit the gas. 
The next weekend on our way back, we slash a tire in the exact same spot the white light blinded us and the sound. I have never seen my father scared in his life. We started to hear the high pitch sound. My father got off and changed the tire with Formula One NASCAR speed and hit the gas ASAP. Aunt brother and I were just terrified as my mother was also out holding the light for him. We were scared of. On top of that, the same night our TV and the farm only managed to get a few channels. We saw a real-life footage of a family being kidnapped by aliens during Thanksgiving, and we freaked out. Up to this day, my family has no clue what was that sound nor the light, but boy, we remember the fear. Account 5. Disappearance of Lars Mittank. People disappearing isn't that weird, but whatever compelled his guy to sprint out of an airport terminal, over a barbed wire fence, and into the woods to never be seen, no credible sightings even again, is spooky. No history of mental illness. Edit, no mental illness, but he did suffer head trauma right before the incident after getting into a fight. Wasn't allowed to fly home because of a ruptured eardrum, so he stayed behind while all his friends flew home. His family received paranoid calls from him where he claimed someone was following him. Surveillance cameras show him walking normally to the airport once he was allowed to fly again, but fleeing for no apparent reason afterward. It's possible the head trauma was much worse than thought and he suffered paranoid delusions because of it. Account 6. Disappearance of Chiron Horman. Chiron Richard Horman, born September 9, 2002, is an American boy who disappeared from Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon, on June 4, 2010, after attending a science fair. Local and state police, along with the FBI, conducted an exhaustive search and launched a criminal investigation, but have not uncovered any significant information regarding the child's whereabouts. Horman's disappearance sparked the largest criminal investigation in Oregon history. To this day, his whereabouts remain unknown. Account 7. Disappearance of Prime Ministers. Harold Edward Holt. I haven't seen this one yet, so forgive me if it's come up. But here in Australia, one of our prime ministers mysteriously went missing without a trace in 1967 while spearfishing off the East Coast. Probably doesn't sound too sinister, but the fact his body was never found and there are conspiracies surrounding his disappearance makes it a little more interesting, to me and a loot of Aussies at least. Account 8. The death of Elisa Lamb. She was reported as missing, and the hotel that housed her during her vacation, the Cecil, had found some security footage of her. She was in an elevator peeking out and acting scared, and she frantically pressed all the buttons she could but the doors would not close. She walked out, and the second she did, the doors closed. It could have been a slow elevator, but if so, that takes the cake for the slowest elevator close time ever. Her body was found in a reservoir at the hotel after people had complained about the quality of water they were drinking. Turns out her body was decaying and mixing with the water, if I remember correctly. The creepiest thing is probably that the water reservoir she was in was locked from the outside, and there is only one key in existence, and the manager or janitor, I forget, had the key with him the entire fucking time. I'm from Vancouver where she was from, and I remember it being a very covered local story. Another creepy thing is that the Cecil Hotel also housed the infamous Night Stalker serial killer. Don't stay at the Cecil. Fuck that place. Account 9. Susan Powell's case always gives me the heebie-jeebies, but mostly cause it happened so close to where I live. Basically, in 2009, Susan Powell went missing. It's noticed that she, her husband, and her two sons are missing the next day when no one shows up to work daycare. Family starts trying to contact them to no avail. Finally, a sister gets a hold of the husband, Josh. He said he went on a spontaneous camping trip with the kids on a school night in November and now he didn't know where Susan was. There's a lot of shady details. A fan drying a wet spot in his house. Some blood found in his house. He and his family tried to say Susan was having an affair. She ran away with her suitor. The kids say they had seen mommy in a trunk. Susan's friends say she had become afraid. A journal of hers they found said she had moved to Utah from Washington because Josh's dad scared her. She had told friends that Josh and his dad wanted to share Susan. Authorities later found hundreds of photos on Josh's dad's computer of Susan that she didn't know were being taken. I know what you are thinking. 
Josh killer her. Or his dad did. It seems clear cut. But because of some flubs in the initial investigation, despite all the suspicions, no one could get any real evidence. And more importantly, no one ever found Susan. Or her body. The case stagnated. A few years later, Josh's dad was arrested for having child pornography on his computer. In 2012, after Josh had moved back to Washington, he exploded his house during a supervised visit with his sons. Investigation of the remains showed that Josh had locked himself in the house with the boys, hacked them up with an axe, before they all expired from smoke inhalation. The next year, Josh's brother also committed suicide. And now, Josh's dad, who many believe knows exactly where Susan's body is, if he wasn't involved with her murder himself, is out of prison and walking this world. It's been nearly eight years since her disappearance. And still, we are no closer to finding her body. This case haunts me because all signs point to Susan, a victim of abuse, murdered by her husband who would later go on to kill their children and himself. But we have no solid proof and no body. Edit. Type this up from mine so I'm sure I got a few things wrong. Account 10. Is Dalsk Vinen and Kambomanen, two murder cases in Norway that happened around the 70s, where they found the victims burned, bruised far into the wilderness. All brand tags were removed from their clothing, and there was no way to identify the bodies. None matching their outlook was ever reported missing, and upon further police investigations, it was believed that they were spies during the Cold War. Both cases gets weirder, the more you study them, and Norwegian police officials are still, to this day, asking for tips that could help identify the victims. Account 11. I was sitting on a picnic table in our apartment complex courtyard one night with some neighbors. We were drinking and one fellow, Scott, had a bit too much and fell asleep. It was a mild night and we were all in our early 20s, so we thought nothing of leaving him out there as we went back to our apartments. His place was no more than 15 feet away from where he slumbered in a well-lit area. In the morning, I saw that the table was empty, so I went over and knocked on my neighbor's door, check on Scott's hangover. Thing is, his roommates say he never came home. I'm mildly concerned, but once again, we're all young and don't worry too much. Around noon, he comes staggering across the courtyard in his boxers and nothing else. We left him fully clothed. He explains that he just woke up in a sparsely furnished apartment across the complex. His only memory of the last night is someone waking him up and walking him to the unknown location, where the shadowy person crawled in the window and then let him in the front door. Everyone is busy making jokes, but this is gnawing at me, so I demand that we go explore. When we get to the apartment, the door is unlocked. After knocking for a few minutes, we walk in. There are condiments in the fridge, but no real food. There's a poster on the wall for the band 311 and a few folding chairs, but no furniture or TV. The bathroom is similar with a half-squeezed tube of toothpaste, but no shower curtain or bath mat. Curiouser and curiouser. Finally, the bedroom, which had no bed, but did have a row of dolls against the wall. There's also a pillow and blanket on the floor and Scott's clothes neatly folded at the foot of this makeshift cot. We grabbed his clothes. He had declined to join us, preferring to simply point out the apartment and return to his place and get out of there. Scott is adamant that the clothes were not there when he woke up, which I believe. Sure, he was terribly hungover, but not so much though that he wasn't aware of his surroundings and he would have had to literally step over these clothes to leave the room. Nobody else seemed to care about this event. My roommates, his roommates, and even Scott himself just seemed content to drop this but it's been over 15 years, and it still gnaws at me. No money was taken, he didn't have a cell phone to begin with, he said he had no memory of the person, but assumes it was a male since they basically carried him to that apartment. Why? If you're concerned about the drunk boy in the courtyard, why take him to a random apartment? Did that person live there? If so, why did they crawl in the window? Scott said he had to unlock the bolt when he left, so I guess that person also left through the window, but why? Why take his clothes off and where were they when he woke up? I asked him to smell his clothes to see if they'd been washed, but he never got back to me on that. He basically waved it off as a weird night. I will never solve this mystery. It haunts me. Account 12. In the city I live in, around mid-2008, there was a murder case that happened involved. A 14-year-old girl was murdered, along with her house help. Various theories emerged, 
including one very prominent one where her own parents committed the crime. They were even implicated in it. They were only recently given bail, and to this day, nobody knows who killed her. Her name was Arushi Talwar. It was something that really shook the country. Account 13. There's a small town next to where I live where a little girl named Cherry Mayen disappeared. She got off at her bus stop one evening after school and vanished. No one is really sure what happened to her to this day. We have a rather long trail system running through that town and few others, so the description I read of her and her clothing is always in my mind and has always had me on the lookout while I'm out rummaging around through the forest. There is also a very remote spot where there are at least 100,000 bullet and shell casings on the ground. There are so many that they cover the ground floor for 25 yards, and when you reach down and grab a handful of debris beneath your feet, all you get is a handful of casings. I have a video I can upload of it if anyone should be interested. Account 14. The disappearance of Frederick Valentich, an Australian pilot who was flying from Melbourne who disappeared without a trace. He reported that a giant metal circular object was hovering above his plane, and air traffic control told him there was no other traffic on that route. Radio cuts out after a loud metal screeching sound, and he was never seen again. The Australian government scrapped the documents of the event and the radio recording after it was accidentally aired on public radio. They told Frederick's father that they will allow him to see his son's body on the basis that he never tells anyone about what happened. And the media made up a fake story that the guy was obsessed with aliens, thus taking away his credibility for what he reported. Account 15. It has since been solved, mostly, but the bloop noise always gave me the creeps. Even the mental image of a sea creature so massive that it can be heard from sonar stations hundreds to thousands of miles apart freaks me out deep within. Imagine being underwater, where you have limited visibility, and a creature approaches you that is so massive you can't see its entirety. You look left, endless creature. You look right up and down to the same thing. Some freakish creature that engulfs your entire field of vision. Yikes. Part 3. Account 1. Late to the party here, but I have one. In my college's town, there was a freshman a few years ago who went missing. He was found beaten to death in an industrial park. The last time his friends saw him, they were all party hopping. His last tweet was something like, Someone pick us up, we're gonna die. No one has come forward. No leads have been found. Account 2. The Dancing Plague of 1518. The gist of the story is that in the modern era, an unknown woman entered a village and started dancing in front of the residents of the village. With no music backing her, she just suddenly started dancing. Days passed and she was still going. Other people join her and dance along with her. Some even die of exhaustion. To this day, it is still unknown what caused people to do this, and that really freaks me out. Also, in the 1500s, many of Europe's forests were being cut for firewood, and many mysterious viruses would emerge and afflict the human population from time to time, such as this dancing disease or the sweating sickness that even killed royals in Tudor England. Also, the dancers would express anger or even threaten with violence if you didn't join them. IRC, they shared an aversion to the color red, and dancers in red clothing would make them vastly uncomfortable. Count three. What was investigative journalist Michael Hastings working on before his car suddenly decided to kill him via remote hacking? He had already taken down General McChrystal and said he was about to go underground because he found out something big. He even reported to his neighbor that he thought someone was tampering with his car. People believe he was working on exposing something about the CIA, and after the Vault 7 leaks, we found out the CIA definitely has and uses technology to remotely hack and control cars. So what did Hastings find out that got him killed? Account 4. The current unsolved mystery of the Seminole Heights killer in Tampa. He shot and killed four random people in the neighborhood so far. The city is very edgy right now. Reward is up to 100K. I hope they find him soon. Account 5. Those two students who got lost in some woods and there were photos on their phone from like eight days after they disappeared? Shit freaks me out. Edit. That one is mostly solved. No foul play. They think they wandered off the trail. One got hurt. The other attempted to document location. 
Both of the girls' cell phones attempted to call emergency services many times but never got signal. They both likely died of exposure. Account 6. The case of a 15-year-old girl, Monique Daniels. Her parents didn't even report her missing. I was so interested in this unsolved case because the mother was my algebra middle school teacher and I had always felt like there was something off about her. I personally believe that the stepfather murdered her and the mother helped cover it up. It's an unsettling read. Account 7. The Babushka Lady. A Russian-dressed woman who stood and took pictures of JFK moments after his assassination. She did not flee with the rest of the crowd, just stood and took pictures. She then walked off, and her identity was never discovered. The question of her identity has gone on to become one of the most puzzling questions, giving rise to many theories and speculations. Account 8. There was someone that was eating everyone's lunches at the first job I ever worked. They basically almost restarted the Salem witch trials over it. Then at my next job, the same thing happened. Any job I go to, there is always someone eating people's lunches straight out of the fridge. I don't know why someone would do that, especially since every job I've worked has provided free lunch. Account 9. The British family killed a few years ago in the French Alps in a car. Two little girls survived laying underneath their parents' bodies. There's been theories of a cyclist, and more recently they arrested the father's brother, but nothing has come of it. Somebody shot them all. We just don't know who or why. Account 10. Me and a friend were exploring in a national park close to where we live. We came across this really strange section of trees that was so dense you couldn't see the sky, and the branches all seemed tangled together to create a sort of natural ceiling. We went in at about 2 p.m. Somewhere inside this strange area, we came across an old burial ground with a plaque that talked about the natives who were killed by disease and buried here. We stuck around for maybe 30 minutes max and left. When we got out of the strange thicket of trees, it was pitch black outside. And this is in northern Canada where it doesn't get dark for a very long time in the summer. We ran back to our car and checked the time and it was 1.20 in the morning. We had lots of missed calls from worried family, but to this day, no one believes us. Count 11. One of the recent plane crashes or disappearances in the Pacific with no survivors found, IDK. At some point, someone got a text from a survivor. Let's call him Bob because survivor is a weird word to repeat. Bob claimed to have put his phone in his butt. He claimed that he and other survivors were taken by a bunch of men in suits, their faces covered, drugged, and brought to some kind of bunker or warehouse where they were being kept in the dark. He sent one text explaining all of this. They tracked the text, and it showed up as being somewhere near the crash site, probably on island. Bob ended the text with basically, I know I'm gonna die, bye. The text went viral for about 10 minutes, and that was the last you heard of Bob, and shortly after, the search was called off. I don't know how true any of it was. If it was a hoax, what happened to the person that received the text? Nothing. Account 12. East Area Rapist, Original Night Stalker. He was so creepy, and the recorded phone call of his to one of his victims creeps me out more than most other things I've come across. It bothers me so much that he's never been caught. Account 13. The Dennis Martin case? An unofficial witness testimony of the Key family suggests he was abducted and carried away on the back of a large, hairy man. Honestly, any of the missing 411 cases. They're pretty fascinating if you take them with a grain of salt and check the facts as you find them suspicious. Account 14. Really late, but here goes. My grandma and granddad told me of something which happened in their village during the 1940s. Apparently, in 1942, a German bomb landed in a field outside the village. The next morning, five people from the village, about 60 people in total, had went missing. At first, the police and villagers thought they had been killed by the bomb. However, there were no body parts, not clothing, anywhere near the bomb site. As time went on, their houses were sold and people moved on. All of them were living by themselves and had few no relatives. However, in 1947, two of the five showed up dead in Germany. A car crash had taken the lives of both of them. I tried researching this back in 2015, but couldn't find any credible articles. The only evidence I could find of such thing was a report of an air raid near the village on the exact day it happened. Account 15. Not so much creeps me out as makes me sad. 
But there is a listing on the Doe Network, an organization dedicated to identifying unidentified bodies, for an older woman found dead in a section of a cemetery where children are buried. She had a tiny Christmas tree beside her and was listening to a Jeff Foxworthy tape. In her pocket was money with a note reading for the coroner. I always wonder if that woman's child or grandchild was buried there, and she decided to go and be with them forever. Part 4 Account 1 A few years ago, was woken up from a deep sleep in the middle of the night by this bizarre music. It sounded like a clown singing, Happy, happy, everybody's happy. I thought it was just a dream, until I looked over at my wife, wide-eyed and awake. Did you hear that? She asked. I grabbed a baseball bat and searched all over the house. Our TV was off, computer unplugged, and phones on silent. We never discovered where the music came from. Account 2. Here's one. And it's a personal one, too. There are strange noises in the sky. They happen all across the world. At first, I was a little weirded out because when I ran downstairs and outside, they always stopped and nobody else nearby heard them. To me, they sound a bit like a massive sky whale or something. They sound like whale sounds. Some people call it a loud groaning or scraping. Governments have tried to explain them in a variety of ways, but those have all been proved to be lies. It wasn't an assumption, it was a statement. In fact, while scientists have been able to disprove what governments have claimed, they haven't been able to find out what's causing them. There's videos all across the internet with recordings of it. It's not construction, because people have heard it out in the middle of nowhere. Ice shelves scraping together wouldn't make sense because they've heard it on the equator. Earthquake-like stuff is also a no, because I live in an area where earthquakes are impossible and I've heard it. Maybe there is a giant sky whale. Who knows? Account 3. The incident that happened around 36 years ago where some guy dressed as Max Headroom hacked into a broadcast of Doctor Who, and to this day, they still don't know who it is. Account 4. I'm interested in every disappearance of a child. So, of course, Madeline McCann is one of my favorite unsolved cases. I also have a similar story in my hometown, 10K Residence, Eastern Europe. In 1994, 14-year-old girl left her house at around 2 p.m., went to see her boyfriend in the hospital, and she reached this destination. No one knows what happened. No one wants to talk about it after 20 years. The guy who was her boyfriend at that time is now an editor of a local newspaper. He doesn't want to talk about it either. This city is like Dodgeville. Everyone is silent. It also have a story of killing Jews in Second World War. Account 5. This one is more just sad than mysterious. Disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley. Amy Lynn Bradley disappears while her cruise ship is docked in Curaçao. Over the next several years, people report seeing a woman matching her description in brothels around the area, sometimes asking for help before being escorted away. It's very likely she was sold into sex slavery. The last semi-reliable sighting was in 2005. She's very likely dead at this point, but I can't imagine the pain of not knowing. Her parents are still alive and still wondering. They've offered tens of thousands for information that might lead to some closure. What a horrific situation. Account 6. My friend had his little brother Garrett go missing in the high Uintas. He was out there with his dad and other scouts and got his socks wet. He was told by his dad to go get fresh socks on at the camp, which was about 150 yards away from where they were fishing. He went and never came back. I remember we had tons of searches for him and never found much of anything. The only thing that ever turned up was one of his socks a few months later. Account 7. Kaneka Jenkins. I've been following the case since it happened in September. Girl was found dead half-naked in a freezer in the unused kitchen of a hotel in Chicago the day after she goes missing from a kickback in one of the rooms. Live videos from the party strongly hint that her friends sold her or something along those lines and the hotel, where one of her friends worked, is most likely covering something up. She was missing over 24 hours when they found her. Her friends had her keys and phone. No security footage that show her actually walking into the freezer. Hotel says that particular camera was not working at the time, but there's hours of security footage of her stumbling around the hotel, lobby, and operational kitchen very obviously out of it with different timestamps that just don't add up.
Her death was ruled accidental and the case closed, but there's a lot of people on Facebook that are absolutely doing the most trying to solve the case because it's incredibly obvious that her death was not accidental. Autopsy showed that she had some sort of anti-seizure meds in her system she wasn't prescribed along with alcohol. Actual cause of death, I believe, was hypothermia. This case has been bothering me for a while. I hope it gets solved someday. I keep waiting for one of her friends to come forward and tell the truth. Account 8. The disappearance of 14-year-old Loreen Ron is creepy AF. It starts when Loreen's mother, Judith, returns home from an event and discovers Loreen is gone, and the details get stranger and stranger. When Judith arrives home, her apartment building is in total darkness because the light bulbs on all three floors have been unscrewed. Later that year, 1980, Judith discovers three unexplained calls on her phone bill made from California. One of the calls is for a teen sexual assistance hotline run by a California physician. The physician first denies all knowledge of Loreen. Later, he changes his story and admits that his wife is sometimes visited by teen runaways and that this might have included Loreen. He also suggests that a colleague of his wife's, porn star Annie Sprinkle, might know Loreen. Police briefly investigate Sprinkle, but can't find a connection. The other two calls went to a Santa Monica hotel allegedly used by a child pornographer named Dr. Z. Judith receives weird calls in the middle of the night, with silence on the other end, for years until she changes her number and moves. All of this info comes from Charlie Project and sounds like a textbook case of trafficking. Account 9. Several women have gone missing in the Albany, NY area where I live. The remains of a few of them have been found, but not the person who took them. Karen Wilson, for example, has been missing since 1985. No trace of her has been found. It's suspected that there's a serial killer operating around here, and no one has a clue who it is. The police presence in some spots is so thin, they may never get the guy. Account 10. In my hometown, there was a murder mystery at Cal Poly. Kristen Smart went missing one night in 1996, and her body was never found. It's assumed she was murdered. Local police completely fucked up the case. The main suspect had multiple bruises on his face and hands, and was the last person to have seen her, but without a body, they couldn't do anything. The school mistakenly cleaned out his and her dorm before police investigated it, leaving no evidence. The suspect's family, which lived nearby, oddly paved their backyard late one night around the same time. It's thought that her body might be under the concrete slab, but police refused to look into it. Years later, a private investigator sneaks behind the suspect's family yard with a cadaver dog. The dog freaks out, he alerts police, but they do nothing. The suspect also has a long history or odd behavior. So much so, he loses his job at Pepsi because people felt unsafe around him. He was also stopped by police a year before Kristen went missing for trying to peek break into a girl's dorm room. He was let go because it was assumed he was simply intoxicated. Account 11. Patricia Meehan. She literally had a car accident and just walked away and was never seen again. It's one of those cases where there isn't much information about it, which is annoying, but also makes it incredibly creepy. Angela Hammond is another one. She was at a payphone talking to her boyfriend. A man shoved her into his truck, and her boyfriend rushed over to the payphone she was at and chased them. His truck died in the middle of the chase. What's sad is her family still talks about her on Facebook. The boyfriend has since moved on and has a big family now, but it's all just so sad. He still comments on her missing page. She was pregnant by him at the time. They had their life planned out. I can't imagine that. Maura Murray is another one that bothers me. Alyssa Lam, of course. Account 12. The mystery of the sonic weapon in Cuba, the blaring, grinding noise jolted the American diplomat from his bed in a Havana hotel. He moved just a few feet and there was silence. He climbed back into bed. Inexplicably, the agonizing sound hit him again. It was as if he'd walked through some invisible wall cutting straight through his room. Soon came the hearing loss and the speech problems, symptoms both similar and altogether different from others, among at least 21 U.S. victims in an astonishing international mystery 
still unfolding in Cuba. The top U.S. diplomat has called them health attacks. Basically, some sort of sonic weapon was used either to attack or spy on American and later Canadian diplomats in Cuba. No party was officially identified as the culprit yet. Count 13. A old neighbor of mine died a few years ago. Me couldn't find a cause of death, so they ruled it as natural causes. But his house was entirely cleaned out. This guy was a drunk and a meth head, and they found none of this. All they found was a packed suitcase. Account 14. I don't know that it creeps me out so much as it is the one I just can't let go of, and it's the mystery that that just sticks with me. But it's mystery of the Roanoke Colony. How do 115 people just disappear and leave behind a whole settlement save a single skeleton and the world Croatone carved into a tree and then never get found? Account 15. The murder of Amber Takaro. She was killed in Canada after trying to hitchhike her into town, presumably by the man who picked her up. You can hear Behem speak in the video, too. They actually have the last call recorded. Just search on YouTube, Amber Takaro. The whole thing is disturbing, especially when you factor in she knew something wasn't right. It's disturbing. Also, Brain Scratch just had an episode detailing the whole tragedy. I'd recommend watching it if you haven't yet. Part 5. Account 1. Dyatlov Pass Incident The Dyatlov Pass Incident, Russian Gibel Tour Group Dyatlova, refers to the unsolved deaths of nine ski hikers in the northern Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union, now Russia, between 1st February and 2nd February 1959. The area in which the incident took place was named Dyatlov Pass, in honor of the group's leader, Igor Dyatlov. The experienced trekking group, who were all from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, had established a camp on the slopes of Kolat Shiachl when disaster struck. During the night, something caused them to tear their way out of their tents and to flee the campsite while inadequately dressed during a heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperature. After the discovery of the group's bodies, Soviet Union investigators determined that six victims died from hypothermia and that the three others showed signs of physical trauma. One victim had a fractured skull. Another had brain damage, but no sign of an injured skull. Additionally, the tongue and eyes of a team member were missing. The investigation concluded that an unknown compelling force had caused the deaths. Several explanations have been put forward as to the cause of the deaths. They include an animal attack, hypothermia, an avalanche, infrasound-induced panic, military involvement, or some combination of these. Access to the region was closed to expeditions and hikers for three years after the incident. Account 2. A man takes out an ad on Craigslist telling people to show up for a job wearing a certain outfit that include the same color shirt, hard hat, and dust mask. Instructed them to be at a certain place in order to earn some 25 a year. A man robs a bank wearing the exact same outfit, runs into a crowd where everyone looked the same. They never found the bank robbers. The creepy thing is that this worked and could work again and again. Account 3. The Oakland County child killer who terrorized the Detroit suburbs in 1977-78. He murdered two girls and two boys. After the parents of one then-missing victim said they'd give their son his favorite medal of Kentucky Fried Chicken when he got home, his body was found. An autopsy showed that he'd been fed fried chicken before he was murdered. The killing stopped after the son of a prominent GM executive, allegedly, committed suicide. The guy had connections to several other creepy and well-connected characters, some of whom used a sham charity as a means of finding young boys to sexually assault. The case is the rabbit hole to end all rabbit holes. Account 4. The Voynich Manuscript. Some Polish antique book merchant found this book in an Italian monastery about 130 years ago. To this date, no one has been able to interpret the language the book is written in. The book is full of elaborate and bizarre illustrations and seem to cover a number of scientific subjects. Several academic and military codebreakers have had a go at it, with no luck. It is now stored at an American university library. It was long thought that the book might be a hoax, but it has now been carbon dated to around 1500 AD, at a time when many thinkers, e.g. Da Vinci, were known to write in code to secure their ideas. 
No manuscript has proved this hard to decipher, and author, meaning, and purpose remain unknown. The manuscript is fully scanned and available online. Account 5. In the late 80s, there was a boy murdered two streets away from me. We live in an upscale, small, suburban town. He was stabbed multiple times, and the scene was described as gruesome. There was no sign of break-in, so when he got home from junior high, someone must have come in after him or was waiting for him. But then again, no break-in. There was no motive. He was just a little boy. I guess there was an investigation, but that turned up nothing. I've searched the internet by this was all pre-internet existence, so there wouldn't be much anyway. But gosh, that always freaked me out. So weird and scary. The parents moved, and I never really heard what came of it. Count six. Well, I am late, and this will probably be overseen, but whatever. Bradford Bishop. Ex-CIA agent who just snapped one day and murdered his whole family. Then drove the bodies over 200 miles to burn them. He was then last seen with a black woman. Last seen all over Europe. Several years on place one on the FBI's most wanted list. And he is still on the loose. Additional fact. The sheriffs described the kids' room in which they were murdered with a sledgehammer as the most horrifying thing they have ever seen. Account 7. The Paris Catacombs. Many people went in. Some never came out. Also, there's this found footage video of some dude going in, panicking, dropping his camera, and vanishing into the darkness. But I can't tell if it's fake or not. There's things pointing in that direction. There's things that make the whole thing believable. Anyhow, I find the catacombs to be creepily fascinating. Account 8. The possibility that Jack the Ripper and H. H. Holmes were the same person. It would be like finding out murder Batman and murder Superman were the same super, super murderer. H. H. Holmes was in London at the time of the murders, possessed all the necessary skills and fit the detective's deductions that he would be a surgeon or medical student. After he left England, the murders stopped, and Jack the Ripper was never seen again. Back in Chicago, H. H. Holmes built his murder hotel to turn almost every bedroom in his hotel into an efficient murder chamber. He had gas lines lead into the room so he could asphyxiate guests. He would also lock them up in soundproof vaults and let them starve to death. He'd surgically remove the skeletons of his victims and sell them as medical props to medical schools for extra money. He also killed people for insurance scams. Of course, that's where the theory falls down. H.H. H. Holmes seemed to always kill for monetary gain, while Jack the Ripper seemed to do it in order to create sadistic and gory art projects. Still, though, imagine if we found out it were true. Account 9. Star Palumbo. As featured on Unsolved Mysteries, a woman moves to Reno to purse a new life. Long story short, mixes with the wrong people and comes up missing. Her car was discovered with drawings on the inside depicting her tied and gagged with bloodshed. Police also find letters, she wrote, stating the government was put to get her. Lastly, they found books on how to change your identity in the car. Perhaps not the creepiest, but it always irked me. Account 10. Green Children of Woolpit. The legend of the Green Children of Woolpit concerns two children of unusual skin color who reportedly appeared in the village of Woolpit in Suffolk, England, sometime in the 12th century, perhaps during the reign of King Stephen. The children, found to be brother and sister, were of generally normal appearance except for the green color of their skin. They spoke in an unknown language and would eat only raw, broad beans. Eventually, they learned to eat other food and lost their green color, but the boy was sickly and died soon after his sister was baptized. The girl adjusted to her new life, but she was considered to be very wanton and impudent. After she learned to speak English, the girl explained that she and her brother had come from a land where the sun never shone, and the light was like twilight. According to one version of the story, she said that everything there was green. According to another, she said it was called St. Martin's Land. Account 11. The mass murder that took place in Ohio 2017, all involving members of the same family. This was a major story for weeks. Governor John Kasich took time off from his presidential campaign because of it, and then gradually disappeared from the news cycle 
as the leads dry it up. The police are still no closer to solving it. These are... Account 12. Madeleine McCann. I know there's theories, and personally, I'm pretty sure it was her parents' negligence that lead to her death. So they covered it up. I don't think they killed her out of malicious intent or on purpose, but she definitely died in their care. Or when she was supposed to be in their care, and instead of owning up to the tragedy, they presented it as a missing girl's case, and the fat tabloid checks probably helped their guilt. Account 13. Sasquatch, tens of thousands of eyewitnesses and encounters over hundreds of years. Some of them more than one witness at a time, so that would limit misidentification or hoax. Hair samples and scat that have been identified as unidentified primate. And the footprints. Footprints that have been found to be as long as 18 inches or longer. Footprints found in the most desolate parts of the forest where no man has been or was supposed to be. Yet still, with all the advancements in technology in today's day and age, there is still no live or dead body. The pictures are amateur at best, and the scientific world laughs at the notion of such a creature despite the evidence of its existence. Account 14. The Atlas Vampire. In the 1930s, police found a dead prostitute in Stockholm, Sweden, in her bed. They noticed that there were two puncture holes in her, and all the blood in her body was completely drained. They also found a condom in her rectum, and she had suffered blunt force trauma to the head. I suppose that the killer struck her with something blunt over the head, which knocked her out mid-sex, sucked out all her blood, and booked it. There's a freaking vampire out there, people. Account 15. The Tainong North Serial Killer. Six girls were found dead over various locations in the 80s. They never caught the bloke. A couple of bodies were just down the road from where I used to live. Besides the fact the guy was never found, locals who were around at the time all report 12 bodies, not six. I'd also like to point out, local old-timers I've asked about it swear blind they knew who it was, but aren't willing to risk their families to step up. Part 6. Account 1. The Disappearance of Hale Boggs, Majority Leader in the U.S. House of Representatives from New Orleans, member of the Warren Commission, and Nick Begich, member of U.S. House from Alaska, disappeared without a trace in 1972 while flying in a light aircraft over Alaska. No wreckage was ever found. They were declared dead in 1973. Forty-plus years later, there is still no trace of their aircraft. Scut. Account 2. Just watch a documentary on the disappearance of Maura Murray nursing student who emailed her professors there was a death in the family. There wasn't. Drove a couple hundred miles to a rural area in New Hampshire where her car spun out. A passerby talked to her and called the police. By the time the police arrived, she was gone. No footprints or anything. Oh, and there was a rag stuck in her tailpipe. The whole thing makes no sense. Account 3. The murder of Missy Bevers. It was implied that the father-in-law was the likely culprit, but he has been ruled out by police. The creepiest aspect of it is obviously the video of the killer, dressed up in SWAT gear, waiting for Missy to arrive at the church. The way the person just casually walks through the hallway and their weird walk is haunting. Also, the murder plan itself is really strange. The killer most likely knows they are being recorded, hence the full costume. They also must know how tight of a window they have to commit the murder and get away then. If Missy were 15 minutes late that morning, or one of the people coming to the class showed up 15 minutes early, or if the murder took a little longer than planned, there would have been witnesses. It just seems like so many unnecessary risks for a planned murder. Did they want the murder to be recorded? So they took these risks in order to kill her in front of security cameras? Police say the actual killing wasn't caught on camera. That may be a lie to conceal facts of the crime, though, to aid investigation. They wouldn't release that footage anyway, so it couldn't help them in any other way. Account 4. M25 Cat Killer. Or the Croydon Cat Killer. There is someone in my city who has been murdering pet cats for at least two years now. My kitty is not allowed outside at night because of this, nor allowed out the front, mid-terrace, at all. The police are actively searching for the person and now potentially persons, as quite often people who murder cats get bored and move on to people, specifically women. Account 5. 
A little girl named April Tinsley was kidnapped and murdered in my hometown in the late 80s. The murderer left several creepy handwritten notes, explicit photos, and used condoms in little girl's bicycle baskets years later and scrawled taunts on the side of a barn. It's super creepy and never got much media attention. Account 6. Late to the party, but here goes. The Dogmen of the American Midwest. There are hundreds of reported sightings of a creature that walks on two legs and has a very nearly human face. It moves very fast and can run on either two legs or four. It also makes a sound that sounds like a scream. The stories people tell of it are disturbing and go straight to my core. Account 7. Personal Story I live in SoCal and went to smoke weed in the hilltops where we can see the city lights. Out of nowhere, me, my GF, and two friends see the whole sky turn neon green and disappear. This whole process takes about like three to five seconds. No sounds, no planes, nothing to explain the source of the green light. I've smoked at this hilltop before, and it takes about ten minutes to walk on this public trail that's pretty far from any residence. A couple minutes after the green light disappeared, cops show up, which I have never seen before on that trail in my life. I smoked there quite a bit. They kicked us out for trespassing and said they got a noise complaint. I had weed on me, so I didn't question the police, dipped from that area, and still question what I saw that night, about five, six years ago. Account 8. One of my favorites is the Villisca Axe Murders. Small town, Villisca, Iowa, on June 10, 1912, eight people, six kids, two adults, found murdered while they were sleeping. Nobody knows who did it, still unsolved 105 years later. Making it even a little creepier, the house they were killed in still stands. Tours are offered and it's supposedly haunted. Former residents described hearing children's laughter and footsteps while they were in the house alone. Account 9. Another intriguing one is the Salish Sea Human Feet. Since 2007 to most recently in February 2016, about 16 feet have been discovered washed up on beaches in British Columbia and Washington. Though there is no 100% true explanation, it's believed most likely that the feet belong to people who have committed suicide by jumping off bridges. Their angles have detached and broke off and floated up to the beaches. If that's the true explanation, that's still pretty chilling. I wouldn't want to walk along a beach and find a human foot. Account 10. Lost. The Child Murders at Robin Hood Hills. The deaths of the three kids in West Memphis, Arkansas in 1993. There is a great documentary series made about called Paradise Lost. It is a sad and infuriating story. Edit. The Robin Hood Hills Murders. Three teenagers dubbed the Memphis. Three were convicted, then later proved innocent and released. Several books were written about it. It was made into a movie starring Reese Witherspoon and Colin Firth. There have been several documentaries that followed the case through the years. The case started off as a tragic and sensational murder mystery and ended up being an embarrassment to the American justice system, but the identity of the killer still remains a mystery. Account 11. In 1994, it rained blobs of white cells over a small Washington town. Those who were exposed to the blobs got sick shortly after the episode. I don't think they ever solved what the blobs were, though some theories range from waste from an airplane, except FAA regulations require waste to be dyed blue and it's a violation to dump mid-flight, to an Air Force experiment that blew up a bunch of jellyfish outside of the town, though the Air Force denied this. The reason why waste was first thought is because the blobs had two kinds of bacteria, and one of the bacteria is common in the human digestive system. But it also had the eukaryotic cell, which meant it was alive at one point. Some in the town think it was a government experiment, maybe for biological warfare. I don't know. I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but kind of a fascinating story. I'm inclined to believe the jellyfish theory. Account 12. Ghost lights. The Marfa lights in particular. They have set up a viewing area to watch them at night, which means people obviously recognize them and acknowledge their existence. But after all these years, people still don't know what they are. They have theories, some highly plausible and probable, but they don't know for sure. Account 13. The Mary Celeste was found adrift and abandoned near the Azores in December 1872. 
Conditions aboard the ship suggest that whatever happened happened suddenly, as if the crew were interrupted in the middle of routine tasks. No signs of struggle and no signs of a crime. The ten souls on board vanished, never to be heard from again. Account 14. The Murder of Chaim Weiss He was a high school boy at an orthodox Jewish yeshiva, religious school, who was murdered in his dormitory. As of now, I don't believe there are any suspects. While this is a case which is pretty well known in the true crime world and mystifies a lot of people, it especially creeps me out because I belong to the same religious society to which Chaim did and know many people who went to that same school. My own brother goes to a similar one. I simply cannot imagine anyone in our world killing a boy in a yeshiva dorm. Obviously nobody expects a murder, but it always frightened the crap out of me. Account 15. My own personal mystery doesn't really give me the creeps, but instead feels like a dream. In middle school, probably around 2005 to 2006, I remember very clearly reading a book with an orange cover and it had a hippie vibe to it. It was a fiction book about a man's niece and her friends trying to solve the mystery of who strapped bombs onto three National Guard jeeps on a college campus during a Vietnam protest. The uncle was present during the resulting explosions and lost his leg to shrapnel and people died. The first chapter is the uncle's POV at the campus just before and during the explosions. After that, it jumps to the present, and he is picking up his niece from her high school and challenges one of her classmates to a game of basketball. After the game, he takes his prosthetic leg off and comments about how it chafes sometimes and the kid he just beat shows shock about being beat by a man with one leg. I also remember later in the book, the niece's leg is broken when she get run off the road by the villain, and her leg is crushed by the engine block. Like I said, I vividly remember the book, but not the title of it, and I can't find it anywhere. Edit. I just remembered she didn't get run off the road. Her brake line was cut. Part 7. Account 1. Alicia Showalter Reynolds. In 1996, she was 25 years old and traveling between Baltimore, M.D. and Charlottesville, V.A., to meet her mother. Her car was quickly found on the side of Route 29 in Virginia, and her body was found a few months later. There were reports of a man trying to get women driving on Route 29 to pull over by indicating there was something wrong with their vehicle. The case has never been solved. In the last few decades, multiple women have vanished, been murdered in this area. Account 2. This one is a real story from me. Back at last year, I was visiting a friend of mine on other states since we only knew each other via internet. We both loved stuff like scary movies, paranormal stuff, scary stories, these kinds of stuff. So a few months before my trip, we agreed to invade an old abandoned prison near her home. She was the kind of girl that wasn't afraid of doing things like this. So back to when I was already there. We were supposed to enter the prison through a big hole on one of the prison walls. Sadly, apparently they had recently fixed the hole, so we had to find another route. So then we noticed a big open terrain that the owner was probably renovating. It was large, and one portion was still filled with lots of plants and trees, with the bases of what would be a house in the future near the open gate. Since it was past midnight, it was almost pitch black, saving some few spots that the streetlights could reach so we had to be careful. Not only was dark, but everything turned into mud because it rained early at the day. We saw a big stair we could use to jump the prison wall, but we were still thinking how we would get out after that since we couldn't bring the stair with us. And then she told to be quiet because she saw something. I couldn't see a thing because I left my glasses at the hotel together with a knife I had brought in the case of an emergency. We then went to the other side of the land that had less trees but more mud. She grabbed her phone and started recording so she could use the phone as a flashlight to see what was going on. When we were almost near the trees, I told her to stop. I was hearing something really creepy. It was the sound of something breathing really hard, not like a human breathing hard, like a big horse or a bull breathing really hard. She then pointed the flashlight to the spot. I said the sound was coming from and just said, let's get out of here quick. I couldn't understand really why because I can't really see things far away. She then said she saw a big pair of glowing eyes next to a tree, and we then turned back, moving as fast as we could, walking on mud. 
The sound started getting really close, and when she turned her head and her flashlight back to me, she saw something she said was pitch black, with glowing eyes taller than me. I'm 190. She screamed to run, grabbed me by the wrist, and we ran as fast as we could back to the main street far from the prison. When we got back to her home, we tried to see if the camera had caught the thing, but she reacted so fast the camera wasn't able to catch anything clear, and most of the recording was really shaky. We spent the, basically, the next three hours watching the prison in fear, wondering what had just happened. We saw the flashlight of the guards looking for something at the prison site. For as much we were watching, we don't know if they were searching for us or the thing. We never came back to check out that place. Weeks after I was already back at my home, she told me they started demolishing the old prison little by little since then. Account 3. There was a man shot in my hometown around 13 years ago, killed with a handgun for no obvious reason while his wife and two children were in the house. This was in Scotland, incidentally, where owning any gun is very rare and handguns are illegal. The murder weapon was found dumped in a drain close by. The creepiest bit was earlier that evening. I had walked into town and on the way back, noted just how eerily quiet it was. Normally the road I was walking alongside would be fairly busy, as it is a part of a main route between two major cities, and for whatever bizarre reason, they've yet to build a bypass around the town. That night, though, there were no people walking on the pavements, no cars going past at all, barely any sound at all. Thought nothing of it until the next day, when I found out what had happened later that night. Plus, my destination wasn't that far from the scene of the crime. Had I left a bit later, I might have heard the gunshots, which is a bit of a scary thought. Account 4. This is one that happened to me that creeps me out. I was in my house home alone one night. Parents were out with siblings, and I was on my computer when all of a sudden I hear a weird noise upstairs. I head up to find absolutely nothing and go downstairs. It happens again with the same results. The third time, I get sick of it and head into my room, where the noise seems to be coming from. The second I open the door, the power goes out. I hear the noise one more time, but really close, and the power goes back on. No changes, nothing. Either I was really tired or that was a ghost. Account 5. I worked with a girl at a local convenience store in Camden, NJ, in 2003. She was two years younger than me. Worked two jobs. She worked at a Wendy's, too. Went to college part-time and helped take care of her family. One day she goes to take out the trash and disappears in October. Like she wasn't even wearing shoes, just socks. No jacket, no wallet, no money, nothing. No one has heard a thing. Never picked up her last checks. No movement on her social security number. There was a reward up for a little bit. It freaks me out. Like I had just been talking to her the day before. Account 6. Definitely the Black Dahlia murder. It was so precise and professionally done, you'd think it would be the work of a serial killer. But there hasn't ever been any other bodies that could be connected to whoever this person was. So the theory is it was some surgeon. Account 7. I love the case of Ambrose Small. December 2nd, 1919 is that last time anyone heard or seen anything at all concerning the whereabouts of Ambrose Small. It's speculated that he was killed by his wife and her lover, and he was cremated in the furnace of his theater The Grand in London, Ontario. I'm working on a musical about it right now, and it's so good, it explores all the different theories and how they could have fit together. Count 8. The Gilgo Beach Murders what creeps me out most is that when the bodies were found, I was commuting to and from work via Ocean Parkway. I remember when they shut down the parkway while they were combing the area for more remains. For context of the creepiness, the parkway is only two lanes wide in each direction, and the land it sits on is less than a mile wide with water on both sides, and 15.59 miles long with no exits to mainland Long Island, between Jones Beach and Robert Moses Causeway at mile 1529. At the time, there were no lights on Ocean Parkway, so after dusk, you see nothing but pitch-black darkness. In the winter time, that's basically any time after 4.30 p.m. A terrible place to get a flat tire or for your car to break down. There's about 10, 16 murders associated with the Gilgo Beach serial killer. Most are prostitutes that had advertised services on Craigslist, but others don't fit the bill. A man, a toddler. 
which could mean that it's been a dumping ground for multiple murderers for years. Account 9. My high school English teacher told us a story about her friend that was a wildlife photographer. Her friend went camping by herself on a campground. The owner told her that there were no other reservations while she was there. So she'd be the only one. Well, when she got home to develop the pictures she took, there was a whole series of photos of her sleeping. Now that I retell this, it sounds like the owner of the campground was a creep. Account 10. The Tara Calico case, and the picture believed to be her tied up and held with a young boy. The picture was found in a parking lot of a convenience store. The woman who found the photo said that it was in a parking space where a white windowless Toyota cargo van had been parked when she arrived at the store. She said that the van was being driven by a man with a mustache believed to be in his 30s. Police set up roadblocks to intercept the vehicle, but the man has never been identified. Account 11. Roanoke Colony Disappearance. Where did they all go? So the colony was having trouble, so its leader John White decided to go back to England to do a supply run. He told the colonists that if shit went down, put a note on this tree so we know what happened. White gets back to England, but for reasons isn't able to go back to the colony. I think war broke out. After a few years, he jumps on the first ship that will take him, which was a privateering vessel, Legal Pirates. He gets back, sees the place is empty, and goes over to the tree to see someone wrote Croatone on it. There was a nearby native tribe called the Croatans that had been pretty friendly with the colony in the past. White wanted to go check it out, but the privateers said they didn't want to and that they were leaving. Years later, when people visited the tribe, the saw that lots of the natives had paler skin and blue eyes. They probably just gave up on the colony and decided to live with the natives. Some people say the natives attacked them, but as the colony wasn't destroyed, that was probably not the case. Account 12. The Zaharias' Children A woman, Susan Zaharias, kidnapped her children, Christopher and Lisa May, from the father, Louis Zaharias, 30 years ago, and still have not been found, but are alive. She ran away and hid at family's house, and they paid a bunch of people off to keep her and the children's whereabouts secret. Please, please either read up on the case. It is so heartbreaking and so solvable but the authorities will not do anything to help the father. Account 13. The Boston Strangler Murders. Thirteen women were strangled in their own homes with their stockings, scarves, bras, whatever was around, and then raped with items like broomsticks and wine bottles. Their bodies were posed after they died and left to be discovered. They never caught the guy this day. Account 14. I don't remember her name, but the one where the lady was being stalked and ended up dead but the police feel the evidence points to her doing it to herself. There are recordings of messages of the stalker, her, and they give me the willies. Stalking stories in general are always the scariest to me because of the idea of someone watching you to gather info to harm you while you're unaware is terrifying. But the twist in this one of someone that was probably terrorizing herself is really unsettling to me. And there's also the possibility that they're wrong which is also horrifying because the real person never was caught and got the blame put on his victim. Account 15. The alleged Crowley murders in darkest Sussex in England. The cult that was born out of Alistair Crowley's time in Hastings still lives on. But back in the 60s and 70s, many young kids went missing and bones would turn up in the seaside caves or washed up on the shore. They were always charred. Some were tied together to form a pentagram. Nobody was ever caught or charged, but the main suspects were the Crowley cult.